He is worthy. Amen? It is such a wonderful blessing to see all of you right now. I want you to know that we have been praying for you, that we miss you greatly. And we're grateful to the Lord that you're with us today. So praise the Lord. What is the chief end of man? Answer, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I knew that there was Presbyterians in a Baptist church. What is the chief end of creation? Your answer should not change. To glorify God. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. What is the chief end of the church? Your answer shouldn't change. To glorify God and to worship him forever. Revelations chapter 4 verse 11 says this, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. A great American poet and writer talked about praise, and this is what he said, quote, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. As sinners saved From the wrath of God, by God, by the grace of God in Christ, we praise him for what he has done for us. That we were the ones condemned and judged, and yet in his extreme kindness and grace, he gave us our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our joy, eternally, forevermore. And when you think of the Lord God and what he has done for you, is he your greatest joy? Be honest right now, because I can't read your thoughts. Only the Lord can read your thoughts. Is the Lord your greatest joy? When you ponder the kindness of God in Christ to you, by giving you Jesus, are you joyful? Does that joy eventually turn into praise? Is your delight in Jesus incomplete till it is expressed in praise? Those are hard questions that we need to answer for ourselves today. Because it is very easy in the American church, in the evangelical church in America, to say, yes, we praise the Lord. But how... Concerning it would be that we would be the people who are praising the Lord with our lips, but yet our hearts are way distant, far away from the Lord. And the reason that Christians in general don't praise the Lord as we ought is fundamentally we have forgotten the grace of God in Christ. We have forgotten the gospel of grace. We have forgotten what Jesus Christ has done for us. And that's why many times we don't praise the Lord as we ought. We forget the good news of Jesus Christ. And our text for today is Psalm 148, all 14 verses. And it's important for all of us to remember this text today. Why? Because this text addresses the greatness of our God. This text addresses the transcendence of our God, the omnipotence of our God, and the glory of our God. And if you're using the ESV Pew Bible, the blue Bible in front of you, it's page 493. Page 493. And this is what I want us to leave with today, the main point. And the main point is this. 
We are all called to praise God. We are all called to praise God. Why He is worthy. We just sang so many songs about God. That He is worthy of our praise. That He is worthy of all glory. I pray that we are singing that sincerely. And the word praise in this psalm for today occurs at least 14 times. It's a major theme in this psalm. It's actually a major theme in 146 and 147 and 148 and 149 and then 150. It's a major theme of praising the Lord. And the psalmist, who is David, is commanding two choirs to praise the Lord. I'm going to use that language intentionally. Two choirs. As Southern Baptists who happen to be Reformed, we love choirs, don't we? We don't have one today, but in the years past, we had a choir. And I will use choir number one to refer to the choir that's in heaven. There's a choir in heaven. Heavenly beings, heavenly singers. That's verses one through six. And then there's also a second type of choir, choir number two, which is the choir that has earthly beings and earthly singers. And if you have read the last five chapters of the Psalms, there's a a theme of praise that is starting down low and it starts to increase chapter by chapter by chapter. It's getting higher. It's reaching a pinnacle, an apex. It's a crescendo, if you know anything about music. And it's about to hit a zenith in the very last verse of chapter 150, Psalm 150. And the last verse says this, Let everything that has breath, what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything, everything, not just every person, but everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So let's talk about choir number one in heaven. Verses 1 through 6. It's in your notes, by the way, if you're taking notes today. The heavens is known as the abode of God. It's the abode of angels. It's where God dwells. And the text says, praise the Lord. When you see that type of language, it is not optional. As American Christians, we love to have options, right? We're consumerists. We grow up in America. It's our right to choose or not to choose. Well, in Psalm 148, I hate to burst your bubble, but it's a command. It's a command to praise the Lord to all the heavenly beings. And to praise the Lord is to extol the greatness of God. To extol the greatness of God. To praise the Lord is an act of worship. The text talks about the heights. Not only does it talk about the heavens, but it talks about the heights. Any place in the upward direction, in the heavens, in case we miss a part, it's the heights, the high places, the highest, the remote parts, the furthest corners of the heavens. They are to praise the Lord. Then we see another part that's included in this heavenly choir. It's the angels, or all his angels. These are supernatural beings. Supernatural beings created by God. And they're also messengers. If you remember in Matthew chapter 1, it was an angel that delivered good news. Right? Good news about the Messiah. And then if you read number 16 in Exodus chapter 12, the angels task with executing death. So angels, they deliver good news or they execute death at God's own bidding. So these angels are part of this heavenly choir. But also it says, all his hosts. And the first thing that we would probably think is, well, that's probably referring to the angels. Or the stars, I should say. But according to Hebrew poetry, that's actually referring to 
the angels, but not just a few angels, but a vast multitude of angels. The armies of angels. So now angels are involved in this heavenly choir to sing praise to the Lord. And then the text says, the sun, S-U-N. The sun is obviously the biggest source of light and heat in our universe. And without the sun, as earthlings, we would die. And this sun is 93 million miles away from earth. The sun is so far away from earth that it takes oh, at least eight minutes for the light from the sun to reach earth at a speed of 186 miles, 186,000 miles per second. That's how far the sun is. And it takes that long to reach the earth. The sun is 109 times bigger than the diameter of the earth. If you've ever flown over the Pacific Ocean, it takes forever to fly over the Pacific Ocean. That's why if you're flying from here, let's say, to the Philippines, you don't go direct because it takes too long and you burn up too much time and gas. What you want to do is you want to go north, northwest, go towards Japan and China and come back down to the Philippines. That's a shorter route. But my point is, the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, is massive. It is long. It is distant. The earth is big. And the earth, if you put 109 earths together, it would equal the sun. That's how massive the earth or the sun is. Is the sun an accident? The S-U-N? No. How can evolution account for that? How can the Big Bang Theory account for that? I do believe in, the, believe in the Big Bang Theory. God said, let there be a sun, and boom, bang, there's a sun. So I believe in the Big Bang Theory from that perspective. The psalmist calls upon the sun, the biggest star in the galaxy, to praise the Lord. And so what is the psalmist doing? The psalmist is referring to the sun and to other inanimate objects and giving them human qualities, human traits. Why? Because he wants them to praise the Lord. To praise the Lord. Another thing or item in this heavenly choir is the moon. The sun provides light and heat during the day, and the moon provides light at night. Then also it says, all you shining stars. This is a massive choir. This heavenly choir. All you shining stars, all these bright lights that you see in the nighttime sky. You know, when the sun comes up in the morning, and it's with us throughout the day, did those stars disappear? Or are they still there? They're still there. You can't see it because of the brightness of the sun. And when the sun sets, then you see all these beautiful shining stars that God created. He created all of them. I hope we can agree with that. That God is the creator of all the stars and he placed every single star exactly where he wanted it. Like an artist on this grand canvas that he paints this beautiful masterpiece. And he draws the sun and he places it there. And he draws the moon and he places it there. And he places a billion stars and peppers it across this canvas. And he knows every star by name. He knows them by name. If you've read Psalm 147, oh, this is a beautiful masterpiece. This is a beautiful choir. And the text says, you highest heavens, just in case we're missing any part of heaven, it's the upward most part of heaven. When the word of God says, the holy of holies, 
what the writer is saying. It's the holiest place. It's the supremely holy place. And when the writers of Scripture, like the psalmist here, says the highest heavens, it is the heaven of heavens. It is the very heaven itself. We're talking in absolute terms. The text goes on to say, you waters above the heavens. You waters above the heavens. It's referring to the clouds, to the rain clouds. I hope you're seeing a grand canvas, a beautiful choir, where the psalmist is saying, you, 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 and all of you, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, the Creator. That's choir number one. He wants all of heaven and all the heavenly beings to praise the one who created them. And so how do we know that God is glorious? When we look at the nighttime sky, or we look at the landscape during the day, how do we know that God is glorious? If you don't have a Bible in your hand, and you're some unsaved pagan out there in the world, how do you know that God is the creator and that he's glorious? You look to the sun. You look to the moon. You look to the stars, you look at the rivers, you look at the rain clouds, you look at the oceans, you look at the mountains, and you look at the valleys. God is the creator. The very existence of the sun, the very existence of the moon, and the stars and the heavenly beings shows the greatness of God, shows the power of God, shows the glory of God. Like, those who believe in evolution, I wonder if they're actually engaging their brains. You know, I had a conversation recently with someone who said, I believe in evolution. I said, okay, let's talk about that. So what do you believe about evolution? And this person tells me, well, we came from nothing. We were... Uh, like an amoeba cell, and we somehow grew more cells, and we somehow had a million cells, and then we ended up on a beach, and we became a salamander, and the salamander became a dog, and the dog became a monkey, and the monkey became a human being. I looked at him, and I said, are you on CBD right now? Because that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You think all of this is an accident? Look at the eye, how complicated the eye is. Look at your hand, how it moves, how complicated that is. Look at your lungs, how it takes in air and breathes out carbon dioxide. And then it brings in air again. How come human beings don't have three eyes three arms, and 24 legs. How come humans don't have that? Because God the Creator created us exactly the way He wanted. With two eyes, most of us. One nose, one mouth, two arms, two legs. This is not an accident, brothers and sisters. Verse 5 says, let them, the heavens and the heavenly beings, praise the Lord. And why should we praise the Lord? Why should that heavenly choir praise the Lord? Here's the answer. For he commanded, and they were created. He commanded, and they were created. Last week, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago, I talked about God speaking things into existence. He created everything out of nothing. He did not have extra water, extra dirt, extra this, extra that. And they said, well, I'm going to go ahead and put this together. No. There was no extra supplies. And God spoke it into existence. And God is the only one who can speak things into existence, not human beings. Don't listen to 
Cleo, the palm reader. Or the health, wealth, and prosperity group. They cannot speak things into existence. Only God can. God can and is the only one. He commanded and it was created. The Lord is the initiator. The Lord is the originator. The Lord is the creator of the creation. He is the creator. We are the creatures. There is a massive distinction between us and God. There are no accidents, brothers and sisters. There are no accidents. We did not come from some primordial soup. God created us. God said, let there be light. And what does it say right afterwards? And there was light. Genesis 1, right? God said, let the expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. It's talking about rain clouds and springs and rivers. And guess what? There was rain clouds and waters and rivers. The Lord said, let the earth sprout with vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit. What does the text say? And there it was. God spoke it, and there it was. God said, let the lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And the God made the two great lights, the greater light, which is the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night and the stars. And there it was. God said, let there be. And there it was. God is the creator. When we look at creation, we should say that God is the creator. God can only do this. God has all power to do this. And no one else. No one else. God has absolute power in creation. Even a person who doesn't have the gospel, who doesn't have a Bible, who doesn't know Jesus, doesn't know God from a goat, when he looks at revelation, general revelation, of what God has created in the landscape, that person knows God exists. He knows. Whether he wants to verbally admit it or not, he knows God exists. And God created the universe. He just suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. And there's enough general revelation. There's enough of God's beautiful landscape to condemn a sinner to hell. It doesn't save them, but there's enough to condemn them. And so what is the proper reaction? What is the appropriate reaction? The text says to praise the name of the Lord. To praise the name of the Lord. Have you noticed when you read the Bible... God changes names. He changed Jacob's name to Israel. He changed Sarah's name to Sarai. God, his name means something. And when he names someone and changes their name, that shows that God has authority. That's what that means. And the name of the Lord is to exalt the character of God. To exalt the reputation of God. It is to say that there is one God and no other God. And I exalt and praise Him. He is worthy of my praise. The psalmist here is calling for reverence. He's calling for reverence for the name of God. Brothers and sisters, does the name of God mean anything to us anymore? I hope the answer is yes. And when we're with family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, and they use the God that we love, they use God's name 
as a curse word to express disgust and anger and frustration. When they use God's name to express blasphemy, does it bother us? Or do we say, ah, no big deal. When we do that, we treat God's name as common. His name is just like our name. No big deal. The value of his name is equal to the value of my name. God forbid. His name is great. There's no other name like his name. He revealed his name to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3 as Yahweh. The Jews would have so much reverence for Yahweh, they would say Adonai. And he made a covenant with his people. The Lord made a covenant with his people. He promised them to be their God and that Israel will be his people. They were thrown into Babylonian captivity. And at the right time, God redeemed his people out of captivity. Why? Because he cares for them. He loves them. When they're wounded, he's the father who puts a bandage upon them. He cares for the orphan, the one who has no father. He cares for the widow who has no husband. God cares for his people. He makes a promise and he fulfills his promise. So to praise the name of the Lord is to praise the Lord. It's to give glory to the Lord. It's to honor the Lord. He is worthy. We just sang a song. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? God's people says, yes. He is worthy. He's worthy of your praise. He's worthy of your affections. He's worthy of your life. He's worthy of your parenting skills. He's worthy worthy of your marriage. He's worthy of your life. He's worthy. He is worthy. And not only is God the creator, but he's also the sustainer. God creates. He also sustains. Look at verse 6. And he, referring to the Lord, established them. Who's them? He established the heaven and the heavenly beings. He established that first choir Forever and ever. And the word established means to appoint or to stand. In other words, to cause them to exist. To cause them to exist and to continue to exist. The sun God created, he tells the sun, go there and stay there until I have no need for you. And God tells the moon that he created, Go there and stay there until I have no need for you. And God created the billions of stars and puts them on his beautiful canvas. And he says, stars, stay there and stay up until I have no need for you. That is the God that we serve. That's the God of the Bible. That is the God who has revealed himself. And so they are in place. They continue to exist by God's will. And the Lord gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. The Lord gave an authoritative rule, authoritative statute. He says, go there, and they go there. They obey his word, obey his voice, and they will stay there until God has no need of them anymore. These heavenly beings cannot go any further than what God has decreed. God has set a boundary. He says, here's the line. You cannot cross this line. Why? Because he is the creator and he sets that line. And his decree will not be transgressed. Now, that's the heavenly choir. Now in verses 7 through 14, we talk about the earthly choir. The earthly choir. The psalmist starts with the animals in the sea. The sea animals. He says, you great sea creatures in all the deeps. He's talking about small animals, talking about massive animals, sea monsters, the Leviathan, 
and the watery depths. And this is important to understand because as American Christians, Westerners, we, we have a hard time thinking like this, but in the Jewish mindset, the sea was a source of fear and chaos and evil and death. The sea represents that. And if you remember Exodus 14, God's people, Israel, exiting out of Egypt, the Lord tells Moses to tell the people, turn to a different place. And that place was called Pihahirat. It's a place where Migdal is on one side and the Red Sea is on the other side. And so God tells Moses, direct the Israelites, my people, to this area. And it is one of the worst areas, if you ever look at a map, it's the worst area for a million plus people to be. Why? Because they are literally trapped. They have the Red Sea in front of them that represents evil and chaos and death. And guess what's behind them? The Egyptians, ready to capture them, enslave them all over again in Egypt. And now they're trapped. They got nowhere to go. And so they cry out to the Lord, Lord, help us. As a matter of fact, as classic Israelites, they complain to Moses again. And they tell Moses, Moses, why have you taken, out of, taken us out of Egypt to die here? Is because there's no more graves? In other words, it would be better for us to die in Egypt than to die right here in front of the Red Sea. That's what they're saying. And the Lord hears their cry. And the Lord steps in and intervenes and rescues and redeems his people. How? He parts the Red Sea. He conquers the Red Sea, which is what? Symbolizes death and evil and chaos. It's only by God's mighty power in hand that he redeems his people. And so the people cross over on dry land. And the people are rescued. That should remind us of Luke chapter 8. And in verse 24, the disciples are in the boat with Jesus. Jesus has fallen asleep, and now the boat is in the midst of this tempestuous wind or storm. It's a storm that rages. And the disciples are afraid, they're scared, and they wake up Jesus and they say to Jesus, We're perishing. Jesus, we're perishing. And what does Jesus do? He gets up and rebukes the wind and the waves. And now there is a peace. There's a calm. There's no more storm. And that is to prove the power of Jesus Christ, the glory of God in Christ. And the disciples say, even the winds and the waves obey him. The winds and the waves obey Jesus. He has power over natural forces. And yet when we go back to Psalm 148, every animal in the sea, small animal, large animal, in the watery depths, what are they called to do? They're called to praise the Lord. Everything that was opposed to the Lord in the sea is now called to praise the Lord. And this earthly choir Includes not only sea animals, but fire, lightning, hail, snow, mist, which is clouds, stormy winds. The Lord says to these elements, go, and they go at his bidding. They obey the Lord. All these natural forces, they're praising the Lord. The psalmist is calling them to praise the Lord. So the Lord is putting together a massive heavenly choir, but he's also putting together a massive earthly choir. Look at verses 9 and 10. This is geographical or botanical or zoological, however words you want to use here. But in verses 9 and 10, the choir now includes mountains and all hills. Fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and beasts, and all livestock, which is cattle, 
creeping things like reptiles and flying birds, which is winged fowl. All these elements are personified again. They are called to praise the Lord. And now in verses 11 and 12, the psalmist calls all human beings. We're going from land to trees to now people. All human beings are called to praise the Lord. The text says all peoples and rulers of nations. When it says princes and rulers, which is judges of the earth. So now this choir includes those in royal authority. Those who are the who's who. Those who have power and prestige. The princes and rulers of the earth. They're called into this earthly choir. Isn't that interesting? Because if you read the Psalms in Psalm chapter 2, it's very clear what the psalmist is doing. The psalmist is saying in Psalm chapter 2 that the nations hate the Son of God. They are against His anointed. It says this, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. The kings of the earth, they're against King Jesus. And in verse 10, same chapter, it says, Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warmed, O O rulers of the earth. The kings of the earth who who oppose God's anointed one, the Savior, now is called to praise the sovereign king of the universe. This is amazing. Because now the king of all kings is receiving his due. The king of all kings is being praised. And then in Psalm 138, verse 4 and 5, we see the earthly kings praising this true king. It says this, All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of God. Great is the glory of God. These kings are going to give their thanks to the true king. And this is a fulfillment of Psalm 117. 117 says, praise the Lord, not some nations, but all nations. Extol him, all peoples. This earthly choir includes kings, nations, rulers, land, trees, animals. And now this earthly choir includes young men and young women. Together with old men and children, this earthly choir includes those who have authority and prestige and those who are the common man. This earthly choir includes old and young, men and women, the elderly and the children. This is the earthly choir. Choir number two. And so in verse 13, the psalmist has a wish. It's actually a good wish, a positive wish. And he says this, let them, referring to the people of the earth, the second choir, praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So this heavenly choir is to praise the name of the Lord, and now this earthly choir is to praise the name of the Lord is to exalt the Lord for His name, His reputation is perfect. He is exalted. There is no one like our God. He is worthy of praise. He is glorious. And His majesty is above the earth and the heaven. As far as you could think of God, if you could contemplate God and comprehend God, Multiply that by a million, and you're still short. 
Multiply that by a billion, and you're still short. Multiply that by a trillion, and you're still short. Multiply that by a zillion, and you're still short of the greatness of God, the glory of God. Don't think that God is like us. His ways are not our ways. He is much higher than us, greater than us. We can't even compare to the Lord. He is transcendent. He is glorious. He is majestic. And He is praiseworthy. There is no rival to our God. So this earthly choir is to honor the Lord. But this earthly choir not only includes human beings in general, now includes a unique people group. A unique people group. You see that in verse 14. It is the people of God. The people of God is to praise the Lord. The Lord has raised up or lifted up a horn for His people. A horn for His people. A horn represents strength, military strength, victory. It's a symbol of power. But in Psalm 148, the word horn symbolizes a king. Not just any king, but a Davidic king. And through this king, the Lord gives his people victory. Psalm 132.17 says it, says it like this. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. The Lord swore an oath to David. What was that promise? What was that oath? He said, David, one of your descendants will be upon your throne. He will be the horn of David. In other words, he will be the branch of David. In other words, he is the son of David and yet David's Lord. In other words, he is the Messiah who is king. He is the Messiah. And when we look at Luke 169, we've got to connect these two now. When we look at Luke 169, Zechariah's prophecy, where it says this, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. This is the only place in the entire New Testament where the word horn is in the singular. H-O-R-N. It's the only place. And why is that important? Because it's referring to one person, not several people. And where it says in verse 69, in the house of his servant David, that language is royalty language connected to the horn. And that person can only be Jesus Christ. If you take out that, the servant of David... It looks like it's referring to John the Baptist. But there's royalty language. John the Baptist is not royalty. It's King Jesus who is royalty. It's talking about Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus is the horn of salvation. He's the strength of salvation. And David is saying, the Lord will raise up. Or actually, he has raised up. This horn. It's not future tense. It's not present tense. It's past tense. And what is that saying? God the Father has decreed in eternity past that the Son, Jesus Christ, is the Redeemer. He's the horn of salvation. He's the only way to be near to the Lord. The horn of salvation is Jesus Christ. And through Jesus is the way to be near to the Lord. Look at this in John 8, 24. Jesus says, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that unless you believe that he is the Messiah, you will die in your sins. Let me apply that to us or to you, if you're not a Christian, 
If you don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, you will die in your sins. You will die in your sins. So who do you think Jesus is? Is Jesus the Messiah where it's just some intellectual knowledge that you affirm? Or is it a truth that burns deeply in your bosom, in your soul, in your heart, that you trust? Hebrews 10.20 says it like this, By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. The writer of Hebrews saying, you want to be in the presence of the holy God? You got to come through the perfect sacrifice. And the perfect sacrifice is Jesus Christ and him alone. There is no other sacrifice. Don't look to anyone else. It is Jesus and him alone through the blood of Jesus. That Jesus lived for sinners and died for sinners. He's the only way to be near to the Lord, the holy God. Through Jesus Christ alone. So do you have an intellectual knowledge? Or is your life, your soul, dependent upon that truth? That you receive it with great joy. And that joy turns into and motivates you to praise God. That Jesus is the horn of salvation. That Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the Christ. There is no other Savior but Him. And I trust Him. I believe in Him. He is my Savior. Can you say that? Amen. That He is my Savior. If you say Jesus is the Savior, well, that's biblically true. But is it personal? Is He your Savior? That should motivate us to sing a song of praise. Like we see here in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, where it says, Therefore God has highly exalted Him. And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you believe that? Do you worship him as Lord? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus is the mediator. And Jesus is the Savior. Whether a person is alive or whether a person is dead, all will praise the Lord. All will praise the Lord. All will bring glory to God. All will worship Him. Why? Because He's the Creator. Why? Because he commanded and it was created. Why? Because he established a decree and it will not fail. And God has given his people to come near to him through the horn of salvation, who is Jesus, the only Savior. There's a church in California that I like to attend when I'm taking little weekend breaks. And this church preaches sound doctrine, a biblical gospel. I love it. I'm encouraged and edified by it. But one of the reasons I go to this church also, I'll be honest with you, is they have a massive choir. I love it when hundreds of people stand together with one voice and one mind and one biblical truth and they project their voice, and you feel the, rev the reverberation, the, the sound just bounce off your chest, and you're just shaking. And you're singing praises to God. That's a glorious event. That's a glorious event. And then I made the mistake of asking the choir director some questions. I said, well, I'm, I'm very intrigued by your choir. Like, how do you guys practice? When do you practice? How long do you practice? And then basically what I found out is there's the audio-visual method. So what they do is they have auditions. People who want to sing for the glory of Christ, they come in, they do auditions. So a person will stand in front of the choir director or a group and say, sing. And if they can sing, they say, audio. 
Audio means vocalize, project your voice to the congregation. That's audio. And they'll have another candidate audition, and they'll have them sing, and they're like, ooh. That person cannot sing, and they'll look to this person and say, visual. And visual means you just stand there, and you just lip sync. (laughs) Just move your mouth. But no words come out of your mouth. Just move your mouth. So that's what they do. They audition. Audio, visual, audio, visual, audio. And then I'm looking at this massive choir, and I'm thinking everybody is audio, not visual. And then when I heard that, I said, oh, that's terrible. Like, I can't, in good conscience and good faith, stand before thousands of people and make them think that I'm singing, and I have this song in my heart that I want to sing, but I'm not allowed to sing it. That's terrible. So I just bit my tongue, turned around, and walked away. But you know what? When God promotes us in glory, whether you can carry a tune in a bucket with two handles or not, we're all going to sing. Whether you can read music or not, we're all going to sing. Whether you think you're the best car car, karaoke singer, shower singer in the world, we're all going to sing. We're all going to sing with one voice and praise the name of the Lord. For he is worthy, he made a promise to his people, and he redeemed us from sin and death and hell, and that is worthy to be praised. We are all going to sing with one voice and one song. We're going to praise our master, our creator, our Lord, and we praise God for that. So we know, we know from what we just read how to be near to the Lord. And to be near to the Lord is through the horn that God has raised up. And the horn is Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. But praise God that he was merciful to us. But aren't there others who don't know how to be near to the Lord? They've never heard the gospel of grace. They've never heard the good news of Christ. They're destined for hell. And some of these people, if we were to be very, very honest and open with ourselves, is our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our co-workers, our neighbors, our loved ones, our relatives. And I could go on and on and on. We are near to God because of Christ. Praise God. But there are billions of people out there who've never heard of the name of Jesus Christ. And they will just live and die and live and die and live and die and be judged and judged and judged and sent to hell. Does that bother us anymore? Or have we accepted that? As a church family, as Christians in America, we've accepted that that is acceptable. I would argue that is unacceptable and unsatisfactory because it doesn't honor the name of God, our Lord. So will we say, COVID or no COVID, we're going to preach the name of Christ. We're going to tell people about Jesus. We're not going to just keep it to ourselves. We're going to step out in faith. We're going to be bold for Christ. We're going to plant churches where God leads us. We're going to send missionaries where God opens doors. We're going to raise up another generation of young men to preach Christ crucified. And we're going to tell others about the good news of Christ. Are we going to do that together? Or we're going to allow something temporary, a temporary illness and sickness, knock us out of the eternal things of God in Christ. I pray that we would focus on him. That we would tell others to praise the Lord. And when they ask us, how? How do I praise the Lord? You need to know about Jesus. Turn away from sins and trust in him. Let us do great things for God. 
Life is short and time is running out. Let us step out in faith and honor him. For he is worthy.